All right, we are here, we are live, and this is our first workshop for Block Hack 2020. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. I am here right now with Eric Pinos, and uh, we're going to, uh, as we wait for some folks to, to trickle in here, I'm just going to have a nice little chat with Eric and ask him a few questions. Um, so, uh, to introduce Eric, he was, uh, he was actually the president of his MIT Bitcoin Club, and um, he currently is the ecosystem lead in the Americas for the Ontology Network, as well as being the president of Blockchain Education Network, who is one of our partners here for BlockHack 2020. And uh, they're helping us out with our portal and getting out, getting you guys all the education that you guys need. Um, so I wanted to ask him a couple questions. First off, um, what do you think, Eric, about um, mainstream adoption? This whole this whole like um, you know hard enough nut to crack like we're we're always trying to push for mainstream adoption. So where do you kind of see us in the in our growth cycle right now, and what's holding us back? Hey, well, first, thanks for having me. It's exciting being the first uh, presentation of the hackathon. I look forward to a good hackathon and seeing what everyone comes up with. Um, with regards to your question about which is the you know, about mass adoption, kind of where we see mass adoption. I think it's an interesting question because there's actually multiple different kinds of mass adoption. Um, and so it's a lot about which one we see happening, um, which one you believe is happening. What I mean by multiple kinds is that there's one kind, I think there's two main kinds. One is where everyone is interacting with the technology uh, on the front end, like directly. That would be, with regards to blockchain and cryptocurrency, that would be everyone owns Bitcoin, everyone owns Ethereum, everyone's using DeFi, right? It's kind of like common terms in the household. Uh, private keys become common, like these, these kinds of things become common. The other kind is uh, where it's more in the back end. So the technology powers or will power a lot of the infrastructure that we use in a lot of the applications that we use but people won't necessarily know or realize that they're interacting with Bitcoin, that they're interacting with cryptocurrencies, that they're interacting with blockchain. That just kind of is handled in the back end by the developers. Um, so it's there's a lot of questions around which of the futures is it? Is it everyone's going to have their own private key? Everyone's going to use their own wallet? Everyone's going to own Bitcoin and own Ethereum and these cryptos directly? Or is it more in the back end where people are going to use apps and they're going to use regular username and passwords um, but the technology powering it is blockchain based. That's awesome. Um, yeah, definitely multiple pathways kind of to mainstream adoption. And uh, I think we're aiming for the, the, the world where everybody is kind of using it, but without knowing it. So that's, that's awesome. Now, you mentioned uh, something in there about everybody using DeFi. And um, so that's kind of like the, the, the huge buzzword that's been um, dominating much of this uh, early part of the year. And now we're also getting into this new NFT, non-fungible token kind of craze. So how do you see all of this playing out? What are your, what are your kind of thoughts on this, uh, this space here? Well, I think the non-fungible token craze is interesting because it adds a whole different element uh, of innovation that previously we haven't been doing. Um, so for most time, for the most part, blockchain was really good for uh, finances and managing finances, which is why DeFi kind of arose, is you could create decentralized financial instruments based off of blockchain, based off of the technology. Um, but what non-fungible tokens let you do is buy a non-fungible token is uh, a token that's unique um, individually. So you can have a set of tokens that are all part of the same set and the same collection, but each one looks slightly different. So the examples that people use are like art. So you can have art pieces on a blockchain um, and you can trade them around with each other just like tokens. Um, or you could have uh, game items. So like items within a game or even like music um, as different items. So what's exciting about that is that non-fungible tokens open up all different sorts of innovation now in, in the music industry, in the uh, art industry, in video games, in digital assets. Um, even things like intellectual property and copyright can be tokenized. Uh, and the NFTs are the framework for making that happen. So it definitely expands the scope for what blockchain is capable of doing um, beyond just your like typical uh, finances and financial technology. That's awesome. Yeah, the, I, I'm very excited to see how this kind of all plays out. I'm a huge fan, or at least when I was a kid, of, uh, 
of Pokemon cards. I was collecting them. And so that's, that's the kind of thing that where my mind goes when we start talking about NFTs. I'm like, am I going to actually get to own these uh, Pokemon in a digital form, like in perpetuity, and I can pass them on to my kids? Um, so that I, I think there's some, some really cool things coming down the line. Yeah, exactly. Um, like the, yeah. Uh, you know, just like the, the collectibles, right? Like the, the Surfer Pikachu. Yeah, Imagine yeah. Actually, only uh, five Surfer Pikachus in the world. Like, how yeah. much would the Pikachu? The example that I go with, um, which is which is really dumb, is the in, is more Yu Gi Oh because um, in Yu Gi Oh, I know specifically there was I think it was like the first episode or something. There were only three eye. There were three or there were four blue eyes white dragons, but then they ripped one of them up. Right? Yeah, so is actually a thing. It's like an important plot point that there's only three of them. And yeah. in real life, you know, they make like tons of them because everyone wants them, right? So it's just they print as many as they want. So yeah. it's like, that's not fun. Like, I actually thought there were only three because I was you know, watching it as a kid. And like, Oh, it must be like that. Yeah. Um, but now with blockchain, it actually can be that way, that there is a set number of a certain type of collectible or a trading card or an, a digital asset. Uh, and you can't make more. So that's, a, yeah. that's an important piece of it. So that actually, how much value would you ascribe to something like that if you were one of the only people that could own that, that item? Yeah, that's amazing. Like I was, um, I looked it up recently because I was curious, but um, like a first edition Charizard holographic in like really good mint condition is going for like $17,000 right now. And like, it just blows my mind. Like this piece of cardboard, if you kept it, kept it nice over all of these years, how much it's actually worth. So it really shows like um, proof scarcity and supply and demand. Um, it's such an interesting play. But anyways, um, it was great chatting with you. I think we can, we're can we going to jump into um, your, you got a, a nice talk for us to, about Blockchain 101. I see there's a bunch of folks uh, in, the, in, the, in the room now. Um, so I'd like to quickly draw your attention folks down um, to the bottom of the screen. You'll see a spot called Polls. Um, there's a couple questions there. Uh, I see there's a, a few answers already um, filling in. So on the question of, rate your knowledge of blockchain. We got three ones. We got a few. Oh, we're, we're, we're getting some new votes in. We got three threes. We got a couple fours. We got zero pros here. So so that's that's good to know. We got lots of room to grow there. Um, and then no one considers himself a pro. You shouldn't consider yourself a yeah, pro. It is so new. There's exactly. So much like no one, no one has a, no one, none of us know what we're doing, right? It's like, we're all yeah. figuring this out together. We're all learning this together. The, uh, the the blockchain space is so so new that like how many years before you can call yourself an expert? Like some people only in the space a couple of years, they they might as well be an expert in comparison to uh, you know a person that's just coming in. It's very very interesting. Um, uh, the next question: Do you own any crypto? We got tons of yeses. We got a couple no's though. Very interesting. So maybe after hearing your chat today, the some folks will be compelled to get interested, get get their, their toes wet, get their beaks wet um, with a little bit of crypto. Uh, but yeah, as folks are coming in, feel free to continue um, filling out those polls. There's also down below a ask a question spot. So um, feel free if during the, uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop your question in there. Um, and if you see a question that's already there that you would, would like the answer to, feel free to upvote that. That way it gets to the top of the list and we'll make sure that um, we answer your questions. Okay, cool. So I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to like make myself scarce and I'm going to pass it over to Eric Pinos and he's going to take it away. And again, if you uh, joined a little bit later, Eric uh, was the president of his MIT Bitcoin Club. Uh, he's currently the ecosystem lead for Ontology Network. And um, he is the president of Ben, uh, which is the B uh, Blockchain Education Network. And he's one of our uh, partners in uh, bringing the education portion to you guys here for Block Hack 2020. So everybody give a nice virtual <laughs> a round of applause for Eric as he uh, takes over and does his presentation. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. OK, so um, I'm going to switch to sharing my screen uh, so you guys can follow along. Okay, can uh, can everyone see my screen? Can I get some confirmation that my no? Uh, oh, oh wait, yeah, wait, hang on, I'll make it full screen. How about now? 
that look good? You can see the blockchain 101? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're getting perfect. some yeses, yeah. Yes. All right, great. So this is uh, blockchain 101. Um, when I'm presenting right now, I can't see the, the questions, unfortunately. So um, they'll be read out. So don't worry about it. So like, you know, feel free to ask questions at any point. Uh, I'd rather than a linear presentation, I'd rather have like questions throughout the presentation. You don't have to hold it until the end. You can ask at any point uh, and we can clarify any topics. Um, or if like everyone really understands something or understands a specific component, we can breeze through that piece. Um, so this is a presentation that was put together by the Blockchain Education Network. And what the Blockchain Education Network is, is a global network of students, professors, and alumni at different universities um, that are interested in blockchain. And so it started as a network of blockchain clubs at different universities and the different club, club leaders from the different universities would share resources with each other. So they'd share um, Bitcoin 101, Blockchain 101, you know, anytime someone made a slide deck or they made an educational video or they led a workshop on their campus, they would take those slides and they would share it with the other club leaders. So over time, the presentations got better and better because you had the other clubs to build off of. You know, the clubs didn't have to make everything from scratch. Um, so fast forward to today, we have about 80 different blockchain clubs um just in the the us and canada alone and then outside of the us and canada we have dozens more joining from from uh, international locations like we have clubs from turkey from italy from india africa china um, and then they all come in and they all every one of them has like their own blockchain 101 presentation or their own slide decks or their own resources that they've been using to teach their students in different languages so what Ben kind of does is we compile all of the content together uh, into a resource known as the Ben Wiki that's at learn.blockchain.edu.org. Uh, and then, you know, we go and we give our presentations and we kind of make slides. The students contribute slides and we have presentations here. So this one is Blockchain 101 and we'll just get started on it. So the overview is the, the different components of what's important to understand blockchain. So first is computer networks. Right. And then kind of where we transition from computer networks to blockchain and then we'll end off with why blockchain is important. So first to start off with computer networks. So what we know about computers is that computers are really good at sharing information. This information takes the form of like text, pictures, videos, websites, um, and computers can be connected via like hard lines. You're connecting like Ethernet cables to them or through wireless. So that's more common now, the Wi-Fi. Uh, and the idea is that you share information with people. So you can send people emails, you can send people pictures, you can sell people text and documents and uh, websites. You can make websites and share those with people. But you can share, the big thing about it is the copy and paste. So like if I have a photo, I can send that photo to multiple people. If I have a doc, I can share that doc with multiple people. What computers aren't good for natively is the assets. So when you think of things like transactions, when you think of things like money, when you think copyright, when you think licenses, there's an issue with sending it to multiple people because when you give it to multiple people, if I send someone money, then I have to make sure that no one else has that same money. Like if I have $100 in the real world and I give someone those $100, I then can't go and give someone else those $100. But on the internet, if we have, if someone sends you an email saying like, hey, I sent you $100 or here's $100, how do you get those hundred dollars to them? Is it a file? If you have a file that is like a hundred dollars in a file or a hundred dollars like in a photo, send that to someone, you still have it, right? Cause you have, a, it's just a photo. So files aren't a good way. File sharing is good for sharing like videos and images, but file sharing is not a good way to transfer money. Um, neither are spreadsheets because if you have a spreadsheet and say like, okay, well let's everyone keep track of, let's keep track of uh, who owns what, let's keep a spreadsheet online. And the spreadsheet has everyone's name, it has everyone's balance, you know, how much money they own. And then anytime someone makes a transaction, you update the spreadsheet. Um, and so that's kind of what we do now, right? That's what uh, PayPal does. And that's what banks are paid for is like they're paid to essentially keep a giant spreadsheet of everyone's accounts and how much they own. Um, so that's kind of like the the current solution, right? The, the centralized network. So you have a server that stores everyone's accounts, keeps track of who owns what. And anytime I want to send someone money, like Venmo, if I want to Venmo someone money, I ask Venmo and then Venmo looks at my account, they make sure that I have enough balance, then they process that transaction. 
they send the other person the balance and then they update my balance. Um, so they kind of keep it, keep it up to date. Um, what's the, the issue with this? The, the issue with this is that there's a couple of issues. So one is a central point of failure, right? If a server is keeping track of everything, then if the server gets hacked, then you don't know, you know, it could be updated, it could be modified. It's very easy to, it's a target and it's very easy to hack. If we had to send, like anytime we send photos on the internet, if we had to go through one company to send photos, well, that wouldn't be a very good solution, right? Like we want to be able to enable peer-to-peer -peer, uh, photo sharing and peer-to-peer -peer, peer -to -peer file sharing, which is like a lot of what we've been focused on like in the past, you know, many decades of internet innovation is how do we enable more peer-to-peer -peer services? So the idea now is, can we do the same thing for money? Can we have peer-to-peer -peer money on the internet? Um, as opposed to having to go through companies, because if you go through companies, there's a lot of things, right? The, the, it could get hacked and there's corruption, which is legal, but only if you get caught. There's a lot of privacy breaches, a lot of data hacks, um, which wouldn't happen if you had peer-to-peer -peer money transfer. So the, the idea, you know, what we want to uh, assume is that right now, the only thing that's keeping companies in check is, is the law and like legal authorities. Um, but can we change that? And instead of having it, uh, you know, these, these rules enforced by law have them enforced in the code. So can we protect our money with code instead of with, uh, with uh, policies? So this is where blockchain comes in. The idea of a blockchain is very similar to a spreadsheet. So you have a, a sheet uh, and you have a list of records. You know, each row is a different record and you clump the records together, which would form a block. And so the chain is that the chain is that each block points to the previous block. So this creates, you know, the different rows. Um, it could be a certain, it depends on which blockchain you're talking about. It can be like a certain number of rows or it can be like every hundred rows is clumped together. Uh, and so the reason it's clumped together is clumped together for efficiency. Um, but you could technically have it where each row is its own block. That's the simplest way to think about it. Like, okay, so each row is a transaction and each transaction is linked back to the previous transaction so that when you look at it, you know the history and you can follow it entirely from beginning to end. Okay, this is the entire history of the of all of the transactions that have occurred. They entirely collectively makes up the blockchain. Um, in reality, it's not one transaction per block. In reality, you clump them together. So maybe there's like 10 or 20 transactions per block. Uh, and then that block is linked back to the previous block. So that just makes things a little easier to um, to keep track of and to compute. It makes it a little more efficient. Um, the keys about the blockchain network is that a blockchain network is transparent. And the reason it's transparent is because when you, th the, when you think of it like as the spreadsheet, um, every person has a copy of this spreadsheet. Uh, every participant in the network has a copy in the spreadsheet. And when someone wants to make a transaction, then it gets broadcast out to all of the other people in the network and everyone updates their copy of the spreadsheet. Uh, and when I say people, I, what I really mean is computers. So like every computer that participates in the network has a copy of it. And anytime a transaction is made, all of the other computers update their records. So this enables the peer to peer element because anytime someone makes a transaction, all the other people update their records so that everyone is in sync. You know, like it keeps everything in sync um, for every transaction, every step along the way. Uh, so it's secure because it uses the cryptography and the digital signatures. So if I have a certain amount of um, cryptocurrency, which is the, the money that's like represented within a blockchain. So, if, um, you know, the most popular one is Bitcoin. So if I have a certain amount of Bitcoin, then I have a private key, which is a password that enables me to uh, prove that I own it. And so when I, whenever I want to make a transaction, I sign it with my private key which lets me share it. Uh, and it's also immutable. So one of the key elements about it is that when you're making transactions uh, on a blockchain, you can only add things, you can't remove them. Um, so part of why things are linked back to the previous thing is because if I were to go and change a transaction, like if I were to go and modify something after it's already been confirmed, that would break the chain because each item, each row is linked back to the previous row. So no way you out a row. Uh, you think like a spreadsheet, right? You could just go and delete the row and then everything just kind of fits back in. If each row is linked to the previous row, if you take out a row, now there's a gap and it's broken. 
Um, so you can't do that. So if you do that, then they'll know that, you know, everyone else who's participating in the network will know that your copy is broken and your copy is wrong because it's missing that piece. So you can't delete rows and you can't modify rows. You can only add new rows to the system. Um, a bit more about the cryptography. So we're, we're, what I was mentioning, so there's a concept in cryptography known as public private keys. Um, which blockchain uses to keep accounts secure. So rather than username and passwords, you instead get a private key. And the private key is a string of characters that you can use to um, create a public key. And so the idea is that the private key is, is known only by you. So you are the one that knows the private key. And the public key is your address. So that's the one that you give to people. So if someone wants to send you Bitcoin, they need your, your public key that you give to them, and then they can send it to you. And if you want to send someone else Bitcoin, you need your private key to sign the message. Uh, and you, so you sign the message with your private key and that, that creates a transaction so that you can uh, send them the Bitcoin. Um, and when you have the private key, it's, it's one way. So if, if someone knows, your, if I know my private key, I can generate my public key. But with your public key, if someone has your public key, there's no way that they can figure out your private key. So that's the security in it, is that there's no way to reverse engineer someone's uh, public key for a private key. So you're safe sharing your public key with people for them to send transactions to you. Uh, and you're safe, you know, signing the message with your private key to send transactions to other people. So you just have to keep the private key safe. That's the only thing, um, you know, in terms of like how many combinations there are. In Bitcoin, it says there's two to the 160 possible addresses. So there's no there's no chance of um, people accidentally having the same key or, you know, there's enough accounts for everyone. Like it doesn't need to be there. There is no worry of running out of public private keys in the future because there's so many of them that anytime someone makes a new account, um, there's, there can be this many unique accounts. It says like every single person in the world and there's 7.4 billion people in the world. Every single person in the world can have this many addresses, which is like an extremely, extremely high number. So there's no, there's no worry about uh, reaching the limit or reaching the cap in terms of how many accounts there can be. Okay, so reaching consensus through mining. Um, so the way that the blockchain adds new, new rows to the list, right, to the spreadsheet. Uh, like I said, each node gets a copy of the blockchain, and each node. When, when a transaction happens, it propagates out through the network. Um, so each time it propagates out, what you have are these things called miners, which are really just the nodes, like the computers. And what the computers are doing is the computers are collecting the, node, the, the transactions that are broadcast. They're looking at which ones are legit and which ones aren't legit. They're discarding the ones that are, that are not legit. They're taking the ones that are legit and they're adding them to the records, to the list. To the to the rows as new rows to the spreadsheet and then they send out um they broadcast that they have you know here's the new spreadsheet for everyone to copy uh you know everyone gets a copy of the new spreadsheet with the updated transactions uh and so they get rewarded by doing this they get rewarded with um they get rewarded with a bit of bitcoin in the bitcoin blockchain so anytime that because it's volunteer processing power uh, essentially so you volunteer your processing power to the network to maintain this, to maintain the accuracy, you know, the accuracy of the blockchain. Uh, and people are rewarded by uh, being given Bitcoin. So this is what Bitcoin mining is. And this is why people buy graphics cards. This is why people build out computers just to mine Bitcoin. It's because there's a reward for volunteering the computer to contribute to the network. So we got a, a question here, Eric. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, we have, uh, what is a node? So can you kind of explain the difference between a node and a miner and, and uh, yeah, what that means? Yeah, so um, a node is, is a computer uh, that is running the software, the software of the blockchain. So in the Bitcoin example, if you're running Bitcoin Core, which is the software, then it's considered a node because you have a node from your computer that has a copy of the blockchain. Um, a miner is a specific kind of node that is particularly doing the service of taking in incoming transactions, packaging, packaging them together into a block, doing all the checks to make sure that they're legitimate, and then broadcasting that out. Um, so that's the slight difference between the a node and a miner. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. Uh, okay. So proof of, right? So there's different, 
the, the description that I just uh, gave is known as proof of work. Um, so the, the idea is that, you know, you have all of these volunteer computers that are, that are um, checking if transactions are legit. So how do you know if they're being legit, right? Like how do you know that one of them isn't like a spy or isn't malicious and just trying to present, pass off fake transactions as being legit? This is where proof of work comes in, is you make them do work so that it's costly to lie. Uh, if you think of email, right? If you think of email and you think of spam, spam, why is there so much spam email? Is because it's not, it's very low effort to send a spam email. If it costs $1 to send an email, any email, if it costs a dollar, then the amount of spam will go down significantly because now it costs $1 to send an email. So it's the same thing with blockchain. It's, it's you're saying that, okay, to add a new transaction to the network, um, you know, rather than it costing a dollar, what, what a node has to do or what a miner has to do is they have to spend electricity, uh, you know, but in the form of, of doing computations. Um, so if you have to spend electricity, then it's a lot more costly for miners to try to hack the network or try to lie and try to insert fake transactions because it's costly to do so. Uh, and the more, the, the more transactions that happen, the more secure the network gets because the longer the chain grows. So not only if someone wanted to hack the network and say they wanted to change this transaction here to say like, well, I actually have a million dollars instead of having zero dollars. If they wanted to change it, not only would they have to change, put in, they would have to spend the electricity to change that, uh, that hash, which is associated with that block or that row. They'd also have to change all the ones below it because they're all linked back to the previous one. So it makes it extremely, extremely difficult to, and costly to, um, to lie. So that's why it's the, you know, we call it the, the proof of work because you have to put in the work to, to, uh, to contribute and to be one of those checkers, um, you know, to prove that it's to prove that you're not trying to like, just mess up with the, the system. <laughs> exactly. So proofs protect the blockchain against bad actors. Yeah. I got another question here. Um, sure. So I've heard of 51% uh, attacks. Can you talk about like what that means and how proof of work fits into that? Yeah. So um, it's kind of uh, kind of a bit about what I talked about. So when you have a network, say you have 100 computers um, and you have 100 copies of the spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet is held on 100 different computers. So it takes the majority. It's like majority rule. So whichever... Um, whichever one is the most or whichever whichever spreadsheet most of the computers have is taken as the true one. Um, so if someone wants to hack the network, uh, then what they would need to do is they would need to, if there's a hundred computers, they would need to own 51 of them. Um, because once you own 51 of the hundred computers, then your fake spreadsheet with like a fake transactions uh, is accepted by everyone else because it says, okay, well, the ones that have the most, you know, it's majority rule, right? So like whenever a new transaction is made, there's like, okay, is this a legitimate transaction added to the sheet? Um, but if someone starts faking a lot of transactions, if it's just one out of a hundred computers, you know, which is likely the fake one? Is it the one computer or is the other 99 computers that agree? The 99 computers that agree are the one computer that's like saying, no, actually this didn't happen. This is a lie. It's like, well, that one sounds like the liar because it's only one. And the same thing for two, if there's only two out of a hundred, if there's only five out of a hundred, if there's 20 out of a hundred, you know, if there's 20 computers that are even 20 computers that are agreeing with each other, um, but there's 80 computers that are agreeing with each other, it trusts the 80 computers more because there's more computers that are, that are, um, you know, that are, that are saying the right thing, that are agreeing with each other. And because, as we mentioned, it costs electricity to say something, to it costs electricity to make a transaction or to add a transaction and to present it as a block. Um, you know, what are the odds that 20 different computers are going to lie and say, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money for them to be able to do that. So it's they're likely lying, right? So the, the cost of 80 computers doing it is a lot is a lot more. So it's more likely that the 80 computers are telling the truth where it gets, where it becomes an issue is when you have 51%, right? Like once you get to 51%, then, all right, well, these 51% of the computers are saying this thing. So it still works, right? Like they're technically the majority. So we have to go with them as being the majority. Um, so if someone wanted to hack the network, they would only need 51% of computers to agree with them or nodes to agree with them 
to change the network. The issue is that the Bitcoin network now is is very very large. So to have fifty one percent of the network, you would need like the processing power. You need the electricity of uh, multiple countries put together to be able to successfully hack the Bitcoin network. That's why it's it's considered to be really secure. Is because in order to have fifty one percent of the entire network, you know, you'd have to have like the electricity of of multiple countries in it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so why is blockchain important? Um, so when we think about blockchain, there's a couple elements to it. You know, why would we go through the effort of this whole complicated system that I mentioned? Why would we go through that effort when you could just have a server and you just have the server keep track of everyone's information for them? Right? That's how most applications are built nowadays. You just have a computer server. Um, so there's like seven different elements about why blockchain is really important, and we'll go over them. So the first element is the data integrity, uh, and the data integrity is this idea that you know if you if you have a central server um and then who is that central server managed by it's usually managed by a company and then the company has laws in place that like keep it from from acting crazy with the with the data but you know we don't really see that happening we see that companies are starting to take advantage of the data the companies are starting to modify the data uh you know they're taking data from people and they own it so they own people's data so you know in a peer to peer network, which is what we're trying to achieve, then everyone owns their own data. Um, and because you make it costly for people to change data, to add data, um, to lie, then you ensure the data integrity. Same thing with, it's like what I mentioned with the spam emails, right? If you have uh, an email, if you have an, a network of email and there's so much spam, then there's so little integrity because it costs nothing to, for people to send spam. But if you change the system, so now it costs a dollar to send email, you cut down on the spam significantly. You cut down on the email significantly. So people that send email, uh, it's chances are that it's a, a very, it's an important email or it's a good email because it costs, it now costs things to send it. People can't just send like hundreds of thousands of spam emails a second. The other one is the distributed power. So just like with data, the other it's um, about the power and where the power in lies. If the If a server has control, then the server could change its terms or it can start charging more or it can um, shut people out, right? It can turn off people's uh, bank accounts. It could turn off people's emails and then that person is locked out of the system. Um, so by distributing the power, what you're essentially saying is that, you know, the users can always be able, they're, just like they're always able to send emails, they're always able to share photos, they're always able to share files with each other through peer-to-peer -peer networks, now they can also send money to each other. So you can't shut people out from participating in the system um, based off of whatever a company's policies are. Now with aligned incentives, um, this one is interesting because aligned incentives means that you're, you're taking people, you're taking game theory and you're flipping it on its head. So Bitcoin is a volunteer network of computers. And so how do you have all of these computers volunteering to spend electricity uh, to keep the network secure. Um, you do that by paying them. And so the way that they're paid is they're being given these rewards, these the block rewards, right? So they're given the rewards and because they're given the rewards, now they have Bitcoin. And if they have Bitcoin themselves, then they're less likely to want to hack the network because if they hack the network, then the value of Bitcoin will crash. So you're almost taking, you're taking the majority of the computers and you're taking them into wanting to make sure that the value of Bitcoin stays up. First, you're paying them for their service, which is keeping the network secure. And then second, because you're paying them in Bitcoin, now they actually care to keep the value of Bitcoin from crashing. So they're even less likely to hack. So it's crazy because you're, you're dealing with entirely strangers, right? Like entirely strangers on the internet. So how can you trust strangers on the internet? Um, and you know, these two ways is like one, you're rewarding them and two, you're rewarding them with a token that they'll have a vested interest in making sure it doesn't crash, which would, it would crash if they hack it. So they're not going to hack it um, because of that, or at least, you know, like that's the, the trend is like, you're really going to cut down on potential hackers because people still are trying to hack Bitcoin, um, and other blockchains. There's always going to be people that are going to try to hack it. Um, but the idea behind blockchain is that you can cut down on the number of people that are trying to, and you can actually increase the number of people that are trying to help build the network by aligning the incentives in this way. Then is the security. So the, like mentioned, like when you have 
people's usernames and passwords stored on a one computer somewhere on the server. Someone hacks that one server and now they have everyone's passwords. This is what happens with the leaks, right? All the leaks that have happened because people's uh, or because companies servers got hacked and now they know the passwords of every person that ever used that service. And then you get an email that says like, hey, you need to change your passwords because um, we lost them all. So by using public private keys and by giving them to people, and so people keep track of their own private key and they use their own private key, you don't have a central server that has everyone's username and passwords that can be hacked. Um, so it's impossible to like hack a database and say, oh, I have everyone's Bitcoin passwords now. It, it doesn't work that way. The only time it works that way is when you create an account with an exchange to exchange your Bitcoin. Um, because what exchanges do is exchanges, they keep track of your private keys for you uh, because it's more convenient. And then they give you a username and password. So for some people that solution works, but the only issue is that if that exchange gets hacked, then it's exactly the same kinds of problems that we have before is that the exchange can get hacked and then everyone loses their username and password. Uh, and then they can get their, the Bitcoin stolen. Um, so that's why people say like, you should own your own private keys. You should keep them private. You should keep them stored locally. You know, you don't put them on the internet. Um, so that you you own it and that's really the most secure way of, of doing it then we get into privacy so same thing before the data integrity when all your data is being stored on companies is the only thing that's protecting you from companies uh exploiting all your data are the laws that stop companies from exploiting your data because if those laws weren't there companies would be exploiting your data even more that's why the california privacy act exists that's why the GDPR exists is because companies can't seem to help themselves. Or you look at Facebook and you look at Google and, and Amazon and the massive amount of information that they know about you and just from your data, because it's very profitable for them to do that. So if you eliminate the need to store data on central servers by sharing it with other people directly, then you don't need to, um, we don't really need to worry about that anymore, right? The data privacy becomes more naturally built into the internet because people own their data and it's stored more locally. Uh, and now with preserving rights, kind of the same, the same thing as before, right? Companies have terms of services and you agree to the terms of service when you use the, the computer or when you use their service, but they don't agree to any terms of service, right? So they can change whatever it is that they want, whatever it is that they want. Um, and the only thing that can stop them is, is loss. Uh, and so what blockchain kind of does is it takes it and it, instead of, instead of being protected by law and protecting data by law, it protects it in code. So you put it into the code that, oh, this data can only be viewed by certain people or that this data is owned by this person and this person can decrypt it. This person can choose who to share it with rather than giving it all to a company and then hoping that some you know, US or international laws are gonna help keep the company acting well. Uh, and then inclusion. So this is a big problem is that like half the world doesn't have a bank account. And so we think a lot about blockchain in the US or in Canada, and we don't really see that much of a need for it because it's like, well, why would I send Bitcoin to someone when I could just Venmo them or PayPal them? Um, but when you think about the world and you think about in other countries, third world countries, Latin America, Africa, a lot of people don't have bank accounts because they don't have credit scores, but the government's very corrupt uh, and the banks are owned by the government. So they don't let people of certain political parties or people that belong to certain families hold bank accounts or hold Bitcoin or hold, not Bitcoin. They don't let them hold bank accounts. They don't let them have credit scores. So they can't access banks and they can't access the internet, the, the financial services on the internet. So when you use blockchain, you're able to have Bitcoin. Anyone can create a Bitcoin address and have Bitcoin. So anyone's able to send money online. Everyone's able to hold money online and be able to pay for goods and services um, online. So that really changes the game for a lot of people in the world who live in oppressive, under oppressive regimes or under very corrupt regimes that aren't able to, aren't allowed to transact them on, on blockchain or aren't allowed to uh, transact in the traditional payments system so they can use blockchain instead. Um, and so the last piece is really that blockchain is anti-disciplinary. So we covered a lot of stuff and, you know, blockchain really melds together different areas of study um, from you know economics, computer science. For computer science, we have the cryptography and the mining algorithms that we mentioned. For math, there's all the probabilities, the elliptic curves, the, um, the cryptography, the math behind the cryptography and why it works. Uh, from the economics, right, all the stuff about monetary policy, inflation, right, the game theory, 
from laws we touch upon regulations from foreign policy and how that can affect um, how the technology goes. And there's even a lot of philosophy in it because a lot of the concepts that we covered um, are related to data privacy, are related to freedom. Um, when, when Bitcoin was founded, it was founded a lot on the cypherpunk movement, which the cypherpunk movement is, is on board with the whole peer-to-peer -peer idea. So peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, peer-to-peer uh, messages, peer-to-peer -peer interactions, and now it's peer-to-peer -peer money. So the idea that I can send you money directly on the internet without needing to route it through a company. It should be something that's natural. It should be something you know, as simple as me sending you a, an email or me sending you a photo from my computer to yours. You know, when you connect two computers together, you can just share files between each other. Um, it should be the same way with money, that I can just send money to you. Like It just becomes a natural uh, extension of the internet rather than something that has to be propped up by companies or something that's like if like I said like if, if every time we had to send an email if we had to send it through the government first or if we had to every time we send someone a photo we had to send it through Facebook first like imagine if Facebook was the only way that you could share photos and that gives Facebook a lot of power so it's the same idea behind money it's like why is it that all the money transactions that I make have to be through PayPal or through Venmo and that PayPal and Venmo has the right to like turn away any transactions or even not if they're malicious, just like they can charge very high transaction fees. Anytime you try to send money, um, you know, they could charge you 5%, 10%, 20%. You have no choice because they're the only providers. Um, so now there's an alternative and the alternative is peer to peer money. And so you're able to just send money to people directly through a system that's very natural. It's like just, it's, it's, very native to what the internet is and what the internet, the kinds of things that the internet can enable. Um, so everyone could be a part of this conversation. Everyone could be a part of this movement uh, and this technology and this innovation because there's so many different elements of it from all of these different fields of study. Um, so thanks. So that covers the presentation. Now, if there's any questions that people have, we can go over uh, more specifically, blockchain and how it works. We could talk about different blockchains. We could talk about the things that are being built on blockchain. Um, you know, either now or if you want to send questions afterwards, it'll be fine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. We do have a couple questions, but um, again, I really appreciate your uh, your presentation. It was really informative. I learned. I, I feel like I was like you know a three or four on the uh, on the poll there, but I definitely learned a little bit. Uh, from that, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna read off a couple questions here for you, and we'll see what happens after that. Um, let me hit start answering. Okay, is it worth mining ETH or setting up uh, a node um, that is cost versus reward? I guess this also applies to uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, no, it's not. The thing is that at this point, right? Like, there's so many people mining ETH and so many people mining Bitcoin that um you really need to have a really really good setup like like enterprise level or industrial level setup like people people buy out warehouses and they fill out warehouses with computers from like floor to ceiling hallway to hallway just all the rows like a just to mine bitcoin so if you are going to like mine for the profitability element if you're going to mind just as an exercise, I think it's a really good exercise to like try to, to understand how blockchain works, understand like, okay, this is what it actually is. But if you're going to mine for profitability, what people are doing is they're mining smaller coins that are lesser known. Uh, Cause that's where the profitability is, is like finding out smaller coins, mining smaller coins, and then going and selling those smaller coins. Awesome. Thanks. Um, Cool. There's another interesting question here. Um, is blockchain all about the money or like how is it that there are companies like library being built on blockchain? Like what other kind of use cases are there for blockchain? Yeah. So kind of the, the stuff that I was describing about how you can um, store money on it or the transactions, right? It's a list of records, like a spreadsheet. That's not the only thing that needs to be stored or that can be stored money is just the easiest one because it's the most straightforward like okay you have balances and you have transactions like i send you this as you you don't even need balances um bitcoin actually doesn't have balances what bitcoin has is just the transactions because if you have the transactions uh then you can calculate someone's balance based off of the total amount of transactions they made like how much money they've sent out how much they've gotten in you can calculate a balance that way um and so other things that you can you can calculate or keep track of uh, are things like 
intellectual property or licenses or real estate, right? Medical records, um, certifications, data, social media content, like those are all things that can be tracked. You can track the ownership of them on a blockchain. So where stuff like library taps into it is library taps into it like, okay, making sure that this data is, this content belongs to this owner that it was actually created by this owner um, and then there are the rewards on top of it. So library has a coin on top of it too that keeps it keeps track of through the blockchain. Um, so yeah, so there's other elements besides finance. And we kind of touched upon that before the presentation started with uh, non-fungible tokens and how non-fungible tokens can be used for tracking uh, songs and art and gaming items uh, on the blockchain. So it's definitely lots of potential. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and a part of that, uh, what else can be built on blockchain is what we're, we're putting out to our community right now through BlockHack 2020. We're looking, looking to you folks to find out what else can we build with blockchain. We have um, uh, some amazing partners here that are bringing the technology that they've built so far. And we're looking for you folks to build on top of that. So this is a super exciting time to be in the space. Um, there's a couple more questions here. Let's see what we got. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so how is there privacy if the addresses can be tracked? You said that, yeah, it's an open ledger, right? Yeah, so um, some things are more private than others. So the addresses can be tracked, but your name isn't attached to it. So your name isn't attached. Um, you know, none of your personal information is attached to it. So that, that part can't be track um there are certain like forensics that you can do to like figure out who someone is so that's definitely something like an, an issue in some areas is an issue in other places it's like good um with regards to the privacy but the the where the the privacy really comes in is that if you take data like someone's certificate or someone's uh, a license and you write that onto the chain to ownership or right? like or someone's like medical record and you take a medical record what you add to the blockchain isn't necessarily the medical record itself. What you add to it is a hash of the medical record, which, which uh, is a string of characters that was generated by taking the by taking the document, the record itself, and you hash it, and then you get this output. Um, and by putting that on the chain, you ensure that you own it and that it can't be modified. So when you look at it and you're looking at your browsing through the chain. You don't see the record itself. You don't see like the full, like, oh, here's the entire, here's the x-ray of the person. You just see like a string of numbers. And to you, it doesn't mean anything, but to the person who actually has the record, anytime that they present it to someone, they can cross-reference it with the blockchain to show that the string matches. It's like the fingerprint, right? So as you have a, every file or every document can have a fingerprint that's stored on chain. And then what you're doing is you're comparing the fingerprints. So it's like a public, the public address, like mentioned, is like you can share the public address um, and you don't have to worry about being hacked because there's no way from the public address that they can reverse engineer it to find out your private key or to find out the original document. Um, so that's where it comes in with the data privacy is that that's the data that it keeps private. Awesome. Cool. We got, yeah, we're getting some great questions here. Um, let's see. Um, so I guess this is a bit more of a personal opinion question what technology or future improvements on blockchain do you think are most exciting? Um, I think that the non-fungible tokens is really exciting because you can take blockchain and then you can apply it to uh, copyright. You can apply it to intellectual property. You can apply it to music and songs and art, um, which opens up the whole creative area that previously hasn't been uh, really explored. Right? You can tokenize intellectual property and you can make it so that you you own that intellectual property, and then you can, you know, you can uh, use it in your work. Um, so I actually have some um, Care Bears NFTs. That so it turns out that there's a game called the Sandbox, which is a new game that's coming out, and it's kind of like Minecraft and Roblox. And so you can buy land in the game, and you can buy assets for the game. And they have a partnership with Atari to build out a roller coaster tycoon within the game. They also are building out a Pong within the game because those are both Atari owned properties. They just partnered with Care Bears, like the actual the Care Bears, uh, and they're they launched like Care Bear assets for the game as well. So if you buy one of those assets, it's like you actually own the intellectual property for that Care Bear. So as you can actually use it in your games and stuff. So I think that's really interesting because that kind of creates a whole new uh, way for companies to share their IP 
in ways that they previously wouldn't because a company previously wouldn't share their IP because it's not very profitable, right? So now you're kind of enabling them to be able to be more okay with sharing their intellectual property for others to use, which I think is going to create a whole new interesting set of like stories and, and content that people can make. Uh, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Whoops. I, I was saying that's incredible. Uh, you can have Care Bears as NFTs now. That's amazing. And Atari, yeah. I didn't know about that. I gotta, I'm going to look that up as soon as we get off the call here. Yeah, um, I think it's all the difference because, you know, people have been trying to do NFTs, but I think the biggest issue is that if it's not a recognizable brand, then people won't care. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's very hard to make a brand from scratch. Like, I think CryptoKitties is the most famous one. And CryptoKitties has kind of now become like pretty well-known brand, but you know, outside of blockchain, no one really knows what it is. But if you have someone like Care Bears or Atari or other big brands step in and say, we're doing NFTs now, now it becomes like, oh yeah, I want to own some of those tokens. I want to own some of those NFTs because it's a recognizable brand outside of blockchain. This is an actual legit, like super big brand. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so there's another, there's another deep question here. I'm going to try and uh, parse it out here. Um, for larger data files, is there a way to have off chain repositories that link to a token? And then can this information be distributed amongst different nodes? And then they also are asking about oracles. So it's kind of like a three part amalgamation of a technical question there. Um, what was the first part? First part is um, for larger data files, is there a way to store them off in off-chain repositories that link to a token? Yeah, you can do that. So that's a lot of what IPFS does. Uh, right. Which is the interplanetary file system like SIA or storage, which you essentially have your file. Uh, and so you do, you combine, it mixes, it combines peer-to-peer -peer file sharing with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, you know, blockchain, right? So like you already have peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. So I share files with each other. You can send files back and forth through a network of local computers um, without going through one central server. So that already exists. Right? That's peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. But you add a blockchain on top of it to keep track of who owns what. So like now you add the ownership element because otherwise it's just a free-for-all. Like I'm sharing these files with you. Now you own them and I share them. So like it doesn't really work. It works for files that you just want like everyone to have. It doesn't really work so much for like licenses or like um, permissioned access or um, like you know records right? like you're keeping track of ownership of things uh like a real estate registry wouldn't work so well in a peer to peer file sharing because someone could just download the registry change the information and then re-upload the registry so adding a blockchain element on top of it keeps track of all the changes keeps track of who made the changes keeps track of who's allowed to make what changes uh and you know can tell you if a document that you're getting has been tampered with um so it's kind of what ipfs enables what these decentralized storage solutions enable uh, and you can definitely create a system like that. Cool. And I guess like the last piece of that question there is like, do oracles fit into that puzzle or oracles kind of a separate topic there? Oracles are kind of separate, although they're still an important component of blockchain because um, what oracles enable you to do is it enables you to take data that's outside of the blockchain and put it into the blockchain. So if you're trying to uh, use things like the weather or use things like uh, sensor data, then you need a way to ensure that, you know, uh, at the moment in which it's being written onto the chain, that they're not lying. So if you have, say, like solar panels and you want to do renewable energy credits on the blockchain, so you have, uh, you can have a system where it mints one energy credit for every kilowatt hour of energy that a solar panel is produced. But you have to make sure that when the panel the solar panel is producing the electricity and then it's writing the things onto the chain that it's, it's not lying. So how do you know that it's not lying? How do you know that's, that it's actually a solar panel, that it's not just someone from a computer, like pretending to have a solar panel, right? Or when you look at the weather and when you look at uh, price feed data, so like a lot of them is a lot of oracles right now, chain link is mostly used for price feed data into the different services that are keeping track of like lending or borrowing services. They have to know what the price of an asset is. Um, for the conversion rates and for the, the all the ratios, uh, and if they just use like Coin Market Cap API or they just use like a regular API, then it's like um, you know what if they're being fed fake data? It's like you don't have you have no way of checking the data. So the Oracle networks like Chainlink, what they do is that they say like okay, well let's take blockchain and apply it to off-chain data, which is like a whole network of nodes that are all um, 
they all say, okay, this is what the price data is. This is what the price of Bitcoin is right now. And if, you know, whatever 51% of them say, if 51% of them say that the Bitcoin price is $10,000, then the Bitcoin price is $10,000. Because the same reasons as with the blockchain, it's like, it's very, it's very costly to lie about that. Um, so Oracle's kind of help solve and tackle that problem is how do you take data that's out in the real world and how do you put it into blockchain? Awesome. Yeah. There's a, a packed, a packed question with a, a equally packed answer. That was amazing. Um, so I think there's another one that uh, like riffs a little bit on that, but um, it's, it's centering around this concept of fake news. And do you see blockchain being able to help with fake news in any way? Uh, I think so. I think there's the Oracle idea, right? And you have multiple sources fact checking each other. Uh, and kind of the more sources that fact check each other, it kind of presents a, a trustability score. It's essentially adding a trustability score or reputation score to any news article or any article. Um, and by doing that, you enable, you know, you can make it so that, well, this article makes all these outlandish claims and it has a trustability score of like 10. So, you know, I'm not likely to trust it anymore. Um, and well, the reason why blockchain is so much better is because, you know, if I have a trustability score or if this article has a trustability score, but that trustability score is the trustability score of 100. But it, the trustability score was issued by North Korea. So is it is it really a trustability score of 100? You know, it's like, so that's the thing, right? It's like, you can't have a trustability score issued out by any company. Like you can't have it issued out by any country. The trustability score has to be determined by a peer-to-peer -peer network um, for it to be a true trustability score. So that's why it has to be done on a blockchain system. It's very hard to just say like, Oh yeah, no, this isn't fake news. We gave it a trustability score of 100. Like it doesn't work that way. Like you can't have, you can't be issued a trustability score. It has to be generated based off of a peer-to-peer -peer network of people that are all giving it its own trustability score based off of you know their authority. Uh, and then you aggregate it all into like your general trustability score. That's awesome. So it's like it's all about like I guess uh, integrating these um, smaller, um, maybe trusted blockchains with the the greater um you know trustless blockchain where there's a there's a the saying don't trust verify but there are certain certain sects that we kind of do have to trust as an authority on particular aspects that we integrate into the the greater kind of picture is that is that accurate yeah that's accurate because at the end of the day there's always going to be like authority figures like if you get issued a, a diploma then you know that school has the final say about whether or not you have that diploma um, so they issue you the diploma and you could have the system where they issue you the diploma on the blockchain uh, and now you have the diploma um, or you have a reputation score, right? But now when you kind of extrapolate that, it's like, yeah, you need both things for the system to work is you need both the ability to accept uh, ordained authority, like, okay, you know, these, these, the doctor has a say in your x-ray, the, the institution has the say in your credentials and your um, your diplomas, but when it comes to something like a reputation score, like the the school can issue you a reputation score and your employer can issue you a reputation score. And maybe those are way more highly than the reputation score that your friends give you. But a true reputation score needs to take into account, like how are you being rated across all these different services and aggregate it together. Wow. Yeah, it's just, it just goes to show how like really early on and, um, how like how much untapped potential there is here in this space it's and like those are some amazing nuggets of of gold there for anybody watching to like try and build these systems um for the hackathon i think those are some amazing thoughts there um i have one more question personally um and by all means if anybody else in the chat has some more questions please drop them in um the ask a question bo uh, box but i'm gonna ask a question here um so so Ben, Block, uh, Block Education Network, like how did that start and what is like the vision and where, where are you guys going? Yeah, so that started in 2014. It was a network of Bitcoin clubs at different universities. Uh, and it started as a Facebook chat, a Facebook group and a Google Drive uh, of like lessons and material. And in the Facebook chat, the club leaders would just share with each other like interesting things that they found out about blockchain or um, speakers that they brought in or things that they should do or advice for each other, like as running their clubs. 
Um, and it just grew out from there. So it grew out mainly as a support network for students that are getting interested in the blockchain space um, with all the resources that we have, with the connections that we have, the alumni that we have, that we help students get jobs. We help students attend conferences. We get them free tickets for events to go to these events, you know, to meet potential employers, to meet startup founders or co-founders for their own startup ideas that they have or you know, team members for any hackathons that they want to do. Um, and we just kind of expand on that every year. Like we get more and more universities involved from more and more countries. We do online initiatives, like we do global education campaigns, we do global video series, we do podcasts, we do uh, newsletters and, and social media shout outs um, and spotlights and features. Uh, and we, we try to do like whatever it is that the students are most interested in. And we try to teach whatever it is that the students are most interested in. So if students are really interested in DeFi, we teach about DeFi if they're really interested in games and blockchain and VR or blockchain for energy or blockchain for their healthcare. Um, we try to teach those things particularly. Amazing. Um, so yeah, on that note, I want to thank you again, Nick, for being with us today. And thank you for um, you know partnering with us with Ben. Um, do you want to let everybody know where they can reach out to you, where they can find you? Yeah, you can... Uh, you can find out all of the stuff about Ben at blockchainedu.org. Um, and if you want to reach out to us, you can reach out to uh, contact at blockchainedu.org. Um, and if you want to join the network, the network, you can join the network at uh, blockchainedu.org slash join. Amazing. Again, thank you so much, Ben. Um, there is actually there's a, a, a comment here. Somebody wants you to join their team. I don't know if that's uh, within the rules, but um, you... So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, your, your, um, your opinions and uh, presentation were well received, and I really appreciate you uh, being here today. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. On that note, we'll, um, we'll sign off for the, for the evening, and we'll see you around then. Thanks. Bye, guys. Awesome. Thanks.